There's this quote by John Hope Franklin. There are two ways which whites destroy a black community. One is by building a freeway through it. The other is by changing its zoning laws. The cutting off of the legacy, the cutting off of intergenerational wealth, that is what the 1921 massacre did to the black community. And still some people were resilient enough after that to rebuild. And that was destroyed by redistricting, rezoning, eminent domain, taking property from businesses. I mean, that's what happened to my great grandmother's building. The city bought it because everything around it was being gentrified. Kind of the common theme, unfortunately, that's happened in a lot of the black communities across the United States. We will never have a real scale of all the businesses and all the companies of Black Wall Street when it was absolutely at its best. Black Wall Street went on for miles and miles. Now it's a little block. There are Black-owned businesses on that street, but it's been gentrified. My sister and I talk about this all the time. What if the massacre didn't happen at all? Would this have been a business that kept going in our family? Could it have been a legacy? The possibilities are absolutely endless. Would Black Wall Street had an influence on the entire nation? I'm going to turn this over to Lauren, Jacqueline, and Byron. Thank you, Monica. And welcome back, everyone. And thank you again for joining. Um, as Monica indicated before the film, I am Lauren Powell, and I am the Corporate Legal Vice President and Assistant Secretary at American Family Insurance. And I especially want to thank American Family Insurance Dream Bank for putting this event together and for allowing us to virtually sit alongside each other, even though we're not in person together, um, and to watch this important film, to digest this film. Um, and I want to thank every single one of our virtual attendees uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to watch the film, um, to put comments in the chat, to share how you're feeling. Um, and I also want to extend a very happy Black History Month to everyone. And if you can see, I'm wearing my Black Girl Magic shirt um, in celebration of Black History Month. So um, I think I speak for everyone uh, in this in this Zoom, in Zoom land, when I say that that was a very, very powerful film. And there is a lot to unpack in that film, even in its short 22 minute span. Um, I would say after watching the film, I continue to be left with the same question. And I've watched this film a couple of times now. And that question is, what could have been? What could Black Wall Street have become if the Tulsa race massacre hadn't happened? And I've been thinking about it and you know, a way to explain it. And it's really ex only explainable in two words, stolen potential. We hear about that in the film about stolen generational wealth. What could have been? What dreams, what businesses didn't have the opportunity to be pursued because this massacre occurred. And as Monica shared in the beginning um, of our time together, American Family Insurance Dream Bank has a dedicated focus toward improving the communities we serve and supporting the dreamers within our communities. And this film is literally the tale of two cities. It's connecting the past to the present. It's an unmasking of those families whose names are etched into those bricks that were shown on that screen. It, Greenwood was a lucrative and industrious empire built for and by Black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, obviously. And the thing that I think is the most interesting is the awareness of it. And so I, I guess this is, I'm, I'm calling it audible here, but I would be curious to hear in the chat how many of those in the audience had never heard about this or did not learn a black, about the uh, Tulsa Black Massacre in school. So if you could maybe 
share that in the chat. Um, and so the film we just watched together, it's an authentic look at a once very, very thriving Greenwood community that was devastated by the targeted attacks fueled by the moral crisis of systems that have plagued Black communities for centuries in the entire culture. Screening this, I think, is one step toward advancing a dialogue focused on strengthening those communities, healing those families, and overcoming the impacts of a massacre of people and a community. The stories in this film are aimed to educate us, to activate us, to motivate us on this issue and future issues. And I am honored and I am so grateful to welcome our panelists from this documentary to today's conversation. So please, everyone in Zoom land, let's welcome Jacqueline and Byron to the virtual stage. Hello, Jacqueline. Hello, Byron. Great. Thank you for having us. Hello, thank you for having us. Thank you. We're seeing it. We're getting a lot of welcomes in the chat, so that's great. And audience, just so you know, as I moderate this discussion, I invite all of you to engage in dialogue. We're already seeing that, which is great. Share how you're feeling. Um, and also let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, hopefully we have a, a wide array, uh, array of people from all over. So with that, let's go ahead and let's get started. Let's dive in. I've got questions. So Jacqueline, Byron, my first question, actually my first three questions are going to be for both of you. Uh, we'll start with you first, Jacqueline. Um, I think we can agree that a lot has happened since this film was released in 2021. Would you share a couple of highlights of what you have been up to since the film was released? Um, sure. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank um, American Family and everyone for hosting this and for everyone, as you said, taking time out of their busy day to uh, screen this very important documentary. Uh, yes, a lot has happened uh, since 2021. Actu um, actually, when I was filming this, I was working in the space of advocating for uh, reducing our mass incarceration uh, crisis that we are encountering in Oklahoma. And I since have uh, shifted to working in um, public health. So I work in the policy space of trying to improve um, health outcomes for Oklahomans because we're kind of at the bottom for that. And so trying to help with that and specifically focusing on issues related to women's health. So it's kind of been a nice segue of all of my past experiences. I get to kind of bring all of that into the work I'm doing, working with legislators and uh, key stakeholders around the state to try and improve health outcomes. Great. Thank you for sharing. Byron, what have you been up to since 2021 20, when the film was released? Thank you for having me. Uh, and also, I, I go by uh, Galani as well now. Um, that's something that changed uh, over the past year. It's my name in Swahili. Uh, but yeah, uh, other than that, um, it's, it's my dog's birthday today. He just turned two. Uh, and also, um, on a musical level, because uh, I'm a musician, uh, it's been a lot of me going, I had my um, first time touring with someone and that was uh, deeply fulfilling, uh, especially coming um, from Tulsa a lot. It, it's easy to get uh, just wrapped up in the, the, the cycle of staying in Tulsa. So it was an honor to do that. Um, and also I'm, I'm deeply on a family level. I'm deeply excited to say um, Victor Luckerson is someone who is a journalist and writer who is um, researching about my family and other families in Greenwood um, in regards to the massacre. And um, he's about to film me in tomorrow. He's mostly working with my uncle, uh, my uncle Charles Christopher. Um, but that's, I, I saw something in the chat, chat about a book. That's one upcoming book that's uh, going to come out. So I'm also excited for that. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I saw that in the chat as well. And it looks like there's quite a few folks who are indicating that they uh, were not taught this in school. So just again, highlights the importance of spreading awareness about this event um, so that we can all come away or go away and share this with other folks who may not know about it as well. So thank you both for sharing that. Um, so my second question would be this. Uh, we saw in the film, it's a tragedy. It was a massacre. Uh, 40 square blocks burned to the ground and as many as 3,000 homes destroyed. It was truly Black, general, black generational wealth dissolved. So my question, Byron, I'm gonna start with you this time. Uh, my second question for you would be, what would justice look like 
for the descendants of Black Wall Street? I think it's, um, I always think about that, uh, that Malcolm X quote about when you stab a knife into someone then pull it out six inches and calling it progress. It, it's very difficult because uh, in a sense, we know we can't ever um, undo the harm and now we just have to minimize the repercussions of the harm, right? Um, so yeah, so in, in my life, when I think about how um, I've seen this manifested for my community personally, it's been, you see like the economic disparities, how they manifest in people's pain they store with them, the family pains, um, lack of access to education. So I think um, it would be about integrating policies that help to actually repair those wrongs, right? Um, yeah, of course, I, I, I'm not a policy maker, so it's difficult for me to say, but intuitively it feels like things that are very localized uh, have to do with education, have to do with um, access to health would definitely, definitely help. Yeah, th thank you for sharing that. Jacqueline, what about you? What would justice look like, in your opinion, for the descendants of Black Wall Street? Well, I guess for me, the lawyer comes out in me a little bit when you ask this question. Um, you know, to me, this was a government taking. And so restitution, it's very easy to calculate what the property values were then and then scale that up to current time. So um that is something that I think that in order to, it can never replace the generational wealth, which was lost um, because that was cut off. But that is just clear, something that could be calculated and shared with the descendants. And then also as, as Byron says, Delani said, implementing policies that are not band-aids, but truly um, smart, impactful policy that will develop and grow the community so that it continues to thrive in a manner that was cut off in 1921 and subsequently with the laws that were passed. So um, it, to me, it's very obvious. And I think that what needs to come first is a true acknowledgement of what happened. And until that happens, then the policy can't move forward. Putting Band-Aids on it and having statues and everything is nice but it's not truly uh, repairing the harm. So um, to me, it's pretty clear cut and it's not reparations because these were not slaves. Slaves do not have planes and cars and own businesses. It's restitution, it's a legal action. And so that's pretty much how I feel about it. And, um, and that's probably why I work in policy because I do wanna do things that are going to try and repair some of the harm that has been done. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And if you think about it, it's also spreading that awareness of this event so that folks can spread the word and the policy can be made and those changes can happen. So I think there's there's multiple pieces to it, but I think you're spot on and the lawyer in me as well would, would uh, concur with you, Jacqueline. So thank you for sharing that. Um, this is going to be the last question for both of you and then we'll segment uh, to individual questions. But as, as you could see in the film, Greenwood, and this was something that was very interesting to me when I watched the film, it, it, it left me wanting more. I wanted to know all there was to know about the Greenwood community. Like, who were these residents? What were these businesses? It's just, you, you can see, you can feel the excellence in the video, and it just want, you just want, you want to do the research and find out. So um, we saw that Greenwood was a place where success uh, and Black excellence was actually the norm not the exception. Um, this community had hospitals, this community had its own hotels. And of course it had a very thriving theater owned by Miss Lula Williams. And so as we get a glimpse of that strong sense of community in the film, where it leaves you craving to know more, like I just said, about the Greenwood community. My next question would be, can you both speak to um, the community, the importance of community to the success of these Greenwood um, residents and their Black Wall Street businesses, their um, property, all of those things. How did how did they attain their wealth? Let's start with you, Jacqueline. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I think Byron always so eloquently articulates this when we uh, discuss this issue, but um, Greenwood was more than just the great wealth and the prosperity. It was that sense of community. It wasn't a matter of just one doing well, they wanted to make sure everyone was doing well. 
And so I think until we get that sense back, there is no way to kind of really truly thrive as a community as they did um, at the original Greenwood. So making sure that it truly is a community, that we're lifting up those, that we're making sure the policies have a broad impact in a positive manner, um, but truly looking out for one another. It can't be cliquish. It can't be worried about um, if this person gets something, then I'm not going to have enough. Um, but I also do recognize that some of that generational trauma from 1921 had destroyed some of that community trust. So uh, we have that trauma that we still have to work through. So it did more than just destroy us financially. It destroyed the community trust that made Greenwood thrive. So it was the prosperity, it was that sense of community. And um, I, I try and be optimistic because I see glimpses of it in the work that I do. That we can um, that we can restore it, but as Byron also said, it's not just on the black and brown people. It's got to be everyone. This isn't just the black struggle because destroying Greenwood didn't just hurt Black Tulsa. It hurt all of Tulsa. It hurt all of Oklahoma, and truly, it hurt the nation. So, um, yeah, community is huge. I think it's it's really the core of everything truly repairing itself. Thank you for sharing that, Byron. I'll turn, turn it over to you. Um, tell us a little bit about how the importance of community in the in the Greenwood community among the residents. Uh, I mean, Jacqueline said it uh, very beautifully. I, I think that uh, fundamentally the things that I would add are, I think that's why it's so important, at least to me on a personal level to call it Greenwood rather than Black Wall Street. Because I think just like we changed the, the lexicon from race riot to race massacre, because it accurately depicts something. I think that's the same thing we need to very much push for, for Greenwood. Uh, and I think that's like you all said, it's because it's so communal and fundamental, even though we live in, in this uh, society that's run by financial incentives, that's, it should be the fuel, it shouldn't be the finish line, right? So, um, and that really was embodied by Greenwood. Um, so I think that's, uh, I'm deeply thankful for a community that manifested in that way um, in our heritage, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, when I think of like, on a personal level, like Lula and the confectionery, I think that that can be uh, one type of guidepost that we have now for community and how it can manifest in the future, which is, um, it's it doubles as some place where people can propose to each other. And when we think of black excellence today and black um, just power and black joy today, it can manifest in these forms of leisure and rest and basically um, enjoying the things that our ancestors di died for, you know, um, and that to me is very beautiful. And that to me is a fundamental part of community. Mm -hmm. That was very powerful. Thank you for that. And you actually, that was a perfect segue into my next question, which was for you. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but let's dive into it a little bit more. Um, we, th the film references the word massacre, but if you were in the audience with an eagle eye, you may have noticed that some of the photographs in the film had riot on them. And so my question would be, can, can you explain for the audience the difference between massacre, using the word massacre and using the word riot. And what, I mean, you kind of just already said that the preference would be to like, let's call this what this was, it was a massacre, but maybe explain for the audience the distinction between those two words when you're describing what happened in Greenwood. Yes, so I, I think that um, when you hear the word riot, it feels very chaotic and it feels very uh, dual-sided and um, like a lot of like chaos and anarchy. And like Jacqueline said earlier, um, not only was this uh, civilians, but also the government got involved. Like the Reverend said, it was the only time that America's dropped bombs on its own citizens. So it's very asymmetrical um, and it's very much, um, all of these things that don't describe a riot. So that's why massacre is so, so key, even in terms of just numbers of black deaths, black pain, and all of that, it's so radically disproportionate. It's not only inaccurate, it's a total disrespect to call it a riot. Thank you. I, I think you summed it up very well for us. Greenwood versus Black Wall Street, 
massacre versus riot for those very reasons. So thank you. Thank you for that. So let's transition to Jacqueline. I'm going to ask you the next question. Uh, Jacqueline, so in the film, we see a transformation of an entire architecture and the structure of the Greenwood community after the massacre. And it led to a really a complete erasure of Black uh, African-American contributions to Greenwood. And so my question to you would be, have you seen similar examples of African-American erasure in this country? And if so, could you um, tell us a little bit more? Well, I mean, honestly, in real time, what's happening um, across the nation is attack on uh, critical race theory and, um, well, and the mislabeling of what that is, uh, to be honest, but uh, that to me is a, a clear attempt to erase history um, and to erase uh, our usability to have critical thinking and to see the past and try and avoid the future. So, I mean, that to me is really of most immediate um, concern to me. And especially with this switching so much to the digital age, I feel like it's even easier to try and erase some of the history. And that's why documentaries like this are so important because it's not only capturing what happened, but it's capturing, you know, the fallout and the effect. It's Galani and myself and my sister and like what's happened. And so I think that continuing to have these discussions around um, this particular uh, massacre and others that have occurred in, in California and other areas. I mean, you know, I think about even what happened with Katrina and the erasure of, of New Orleans and the systemic racism that allowed for some of that destruction not to be um, taken care of or prevented in the first place simply because of the majority of the demographic of the population that would be impacted. Um, and then we see it all the time and kind of the, the cost analysis of versus whether or not to help a community versus whether or not it's okay just to let it falter, um, kind of that bottom line. So, I mean, I guess I see it in so many levels, but I will just say for me, the most immediate concern is the fact that there's the erasure of history and the attempt to try and stop people from learning what happened. We can't avoid the ugly because if we don't know about the ugly, then we're going to repeat it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the purpose of learning our history. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very fearful of, of that. And I think that you raise a really good point with respect to technology now to making it easy, easier to completely erase that history. I think that the other piece of that is just the editing of it as well, right? So there's the erasure, but and then there's the, okay, let's keep it, but let's alter it so it's not the same story. So um, I think that those are very, very valid points. And there are a lot of examples that I can think of as well um, that are still happening that are very concerning. And it may not look the same as it looked in Greenwood, but it is still the same outcome um, and it's impacting generations in the same way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, my next question, I'm just looking at time. Um, my next question is for both of you. Um, I'll start with Byron. Actually, Byron, just another audible really quick. Could you maybe share with us um, about your, uh, your name, Galani, and what your preference is? I want to make sure I'm respecting that. Uh, yes, thank you for asking. Um, right now, it's um, if you know me personally, then uh, I don't really care. Um, I, I'd, I'd say in more formal um, situations, I, I'd prefer Galani because my intention with it was, um, and I wrote a about, song about this, um, is basically only knowing yourself through a colonial lens and colonial tongue. Um, it warps your perception. Uh, like we spoke about um, how a lot of times it's edited rather than deleted. There's a kind of way that happens on the atomic level with your sense of self. And it's not that I wanna abandon my past self, and that's why I still go by both. It's that I want to be able to embody, um, be able to embody what it means to exist in this world and be myself in terms of blackness and everything that I embody, um, not just through a colonial lens. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Galani. Thank you very much. So my next question then to you is, as we grasp with this feeling um, of unfilled potential, 
what could have been, what businesses, what things could have changed and improved the world that we live in today that were in that Greenwood community. Um, and as I labeled it in the beginning, it was really stolen potential. We'll never know what that potential was because it was erased, right? And as we think of what truly could have been a black promised land, so this is, and this is back to the massacre, um, the massacre point, but I, th I think it's an important one to highlight is that the way that these words are labeled matter. And so to the extent that we can not only spread awareness, but also be using the correct terminology when we're spreading that awareness, that's very, very important to making sure that folks understand the, um, the severity of what really happened. So more of a comment than a question. Um, but this actually is a question. Um, so could you actually, um, let me just go here. Oh no, that's for Jacqueline. Okay, I'm sorry, Jacqueline, it's for you. Galani, you're off the hook for a second. The next one's for Jacqueline. <laughs> so Jacqueline, um, and I mentioned this already to the audience about a fun fact that we share a career. We're both attorneys, um, but I wanted to see if you would just speak a little bit about how this this massacre, um, this history, your family ancestry, how that's impacted your career decisions and what you have decided to do long-term with your career. Uh, yes, I I do believe that the, the massacre, unbeknownst to me, probably did shape my, my commitment to, to helping the community and improving the community. I, I can't seem to, uh, I've left Oklahoma several times and I keep being drawn back. I feel like I guess I need to share my talents um, and treasures here and try and help improve the community. Um, I've heard stories of my great grandmother being um, very helpful to people in the community. Um, my my grandmother was very successful, but always served on boards in the community to help um, others. So um, I do think that I didn't start thinking about that until we were filming the documentary and then doing some of these panel discussions. I guess for me, I did kind of start connecting the dots as to why corporate law didn't quite click with me when I was doing it um, and why this does resonate with me. So I do feel like that um, that is something that probably is innate that this need to want to uplift the community and, and to do something to repair the policies that help destroy that and hopefully prevent it from happening again. Absolutely. And it's a part of your fiber. It's your DNA, right? It's, it's real. So thank yes. you for sharing that. Um, my next question is also for you. Um, and this one was one of my favorite parts of the film. So uh, we see in the film where your mother, she said, my strong daughters came from very strong women. And you can feel and you can sense the resilience and the proudness and the joy when she says that. So that's actually one of my favorite moments of the film. But I wanted to, to ask you, what, how does that make you feel? I know you've seen this film many, many times, but how does it make you feel when you, when you hear your mother's words? Um. <laughs> Actually, every time it makes my sister and me a little bit emotional. We've seen it, of course, a gazillion times. So um, even though you, like, I know that my mother's proud of me, but to hear her say it because she is such a strong force and she's come from such amazing women. Yeah, it does something to me and it encourages me to like not give up and to keep trying and to know that like, this is what I come from. I come from a legacy of women who do not give up in the face of adversity. Um, I do think we overuse the word resilience when it comes to women of color, but it is in our DNA. And so what I try to do is, yes, I know I'm a strong woman, but I also give myself grace to not always have to be strong because I have feelings. And, um, you know, why do I have to be resilient all the time? So it's like this double-edged sword of, yes, I carry this, but then also, yes, I carry this. That makes so much sense to me. It really does. And you can have, you can be both. You can be resilient. You can be strong. You can be black girl magic and you can also be vulnerable and you can need help and you can lean on your sisters and your brothers and your family, um, your children, all of those things. So Thank you. I think a lot of folks um, that resonates with a lot of folks, including myself. So thank you for sharing that. Um, let's see. Okay, this one's for Byron. And this is also actually another one of my 
um, favorite moments of the film and just a really a question that I want to make sure that we get in before uh, while this time's going fast. So quickly, um, Byron, so memorialization is truly kind of a healing process for everyone. Um, it's the thoughtfulness that leads to the memorialization um, and it can really become sort of therapeutic and a sense of, of, of Jelani, I'm sorry. Thank you, Kevin. I'm sorry, Jelani. Um, but this memorialization can really become therapeutic in some ways. And so my question to you would be, maybe tell us a little bit how you have memorialized your ancestors. Yeah, thank you for asking that. I think a lot of that feels like really speaking my truth and their truth and really trying to embody that. Um, like, like in the, and I think also it, when you think about like in the, in the documentary, how we were talking about how Lula ultimately died of trauma. I think there's a memorialization that happens on a family level, which is making sure that uh, like we can support each other and support ourselves enough to where even when the world still feels uh, chaotic, um, we can still have this type of, um, uh, yeah, just, just power and resilience in ourselves. Also, I think it comes down to being able to talk about it and talk about it very openly, even the painful parts and the parts that are taboo. Because uh, as Black people, um, there's a lot of stuff we've been through. And there's a lot of stuff that's hard to talk about, like in like my my great grandfather Dado barely ever spoke about it. And then that makes it more difficult to talk about. And I understand why, because of how traumatic that must have been, right? So I think now we're at the point where we can, to answer your question, memorialize our ancestors and memorialize our communities through speech and through action and through care. That's great. That is great. I hope I hope everybody's taking notes because that's that's absolutely you're right. Um, and I know we're at five minutes, so this this is probably going to be my last question. Um, but audience, these topics were very deep. But as Jelani just said, these are conversations that we need to have. We need to feel uncomfortable. It's okay to feel uncomfortable sometimes. That's what leads to the growth, right? And I I guess at heart, I'm action oriented. And so the first time I watched the film, I thought, well, what can I do? How, how can I spread the word? How do I fix this? Well, I can't fix it, it's history, right? But I can make sure that the awareness is there, that I am telling people about this massacre, that I am educating my children about it, that they are educating their friends about it. There are things that we can do now um, to sort of put ourselves in a better position for the future. And so my last question to both of you would be, what would be your call to action for the audience today? Jelani, let's start with you since you're on still. Uh, so yeah, I'd say my calls to action, um, I'd say, frankly, like you said, speaking about it, um, interacting with people about it. Also, um, I'd say, being introspective in, I think, how the little actions that we do in day to day um, could help or hurt uh, things like this to happen again. Um, because I think a core thing is we want to learn from history so we do not repeat it. And I think it's it's so core because a lot of, I think, especially uh, anyone who is white or has money who's watching, it's like you have a lot of power. And I think being very, very self-aware is something that helps not only black people, but all of humanity in America. So I think that's very, 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 very imperative. The self-awareness, self-reflection, like you said, the action and uh, yeah, love, thank you. That's great. Jacqueline, what about you? What's your call to action for this audience? Then I would add, um, yeah, don't be afraid. Now I think that in this politicized world, people are afraid to say anything for fear of the um, the repercussions. I, we can't be fearful anymore. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Um, everyone needs to vote and know for whom they're voting. Um, policy is just about change. It's not necessarily about a bill. So if there's something that you see is wrong, find a way, whether it's the municipal level, state level, federal level, you can 
one person can actually make a difference in calling a lawmaker or a stakeholder and making those changes. So I think now we have to be unapologetically bold in our rightness. And so that's what I encourage everyone to do. Be involved, vote, know what policies are impacting um, your community and, um, and volunteer for if you have the bandwidth if there's something you're passionate about, find a non-for-profit. Non-for-profits always need volunteers, always need board members that are willing to work. Um, you can share your treasures and your talents that way as well. So there's so many ways to get involved, but most importantly, we have to keep these conversations going and we have to lean into the uncomfortable. And thank you so much and love, like really truly loving one another. I mean, if we were just kind to one another. It would go so far, would it? goes so far in that sense of community if we just saw everyone as a community we're all looking out for each other um, so thank you for that and I know we are super duper close on time so Monica I am going to turn it back over to you but before I do I just want to say thank you so much uh, to Jacqueline and Jelani for joining us and also um, Michelle who couldn't be here in spirit uh, Jacqueline's sister uh, she had a, a conflict, but we do wish her well, and we thank her for all of her engagement as well while we've gone through this. And so, Monica, with that, I am going to turn it back over to you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Galani, Jacqueline, Lauren. I really, really, really appreciate you all. The dialogue here has been great. All of the questions and comments and conversations that are happening in the chat people dropping nuggets of knowledge here and there, people asking questions are being engaged. Um, I encourage you while I'm closing out, hop in the chat. Galani, they want to know where your music is at. <laughs> Share where your music is at, where it can be found, the book that you mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, hop in the chat, communicate with people while, while I close out. We do have some, some questions in the Q&A. Unfortunately, we cannot get to those questions right now because we are so tight on time. So my apologies. Um, Michelle, we are with you in spirit. We're so sorry that you could not be here with us today. We're sending love and light your way in all of the great things that we can muster right now. Um, again, thank you all so much for your time, knowledge, and reflections. Um, I always get so moved when I watch this film and today was probably my seventh or eighth time seeing it and I'm still not over the emotional part. I don't know what it's going to take for me to shake the emotions related to this. Um, this event was intended as a step towards advancing conversations focused on strengthening communities, healing families, and overcoming the effects of white supremacy. We are beyond grateful for your participation in educating and activating our community of dreamers today. Again, thank you all so much. Over the next month, we'll be hosting two very special events in celebration of Black History Month. The first, Diversity in Genre Fiction with Jasmine Gullery and The Rebel Women of Mathematics with Talithia Williams. We invite you to register for these events by scanning one of the QR codes on your screen. And for those of you in the Madison area, we are hosting an in-person poetry night at Dream Bank. We, is, we have very limited capacity, so register. Um, and to register for that, you can go to mfam.com slash Dream Bank, or if you're not in the Madison area, it's gonna be recorded. You can catch the recording on our social channels at a later date. We thank you all for tuning in today. To stay in touch with Dream Bank's events, programs, our in-person and online offerings, visit us at mfam.com slash dreambank and connect with us on our social channels. On behalf of American Family Insurance and my entire team at Dream Bank, we look forward to hosting you again soon. Keep dreaming fearlessly.